coffee break. Hopefully you're all re-energized with the caffeine and whatnot. Uh, so the next session is going to be focusing on instruments and telescopes, so the experimental side of astronomy and astrophysics. And we're going to talk about the questions that leading telescopes and instruments will answer over the next 27 years. Of course, the department has a history of making leading, uh, building leading facilities for answering questions in astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, beginning with the founding of the department, of course, in the Yerkes Observatory. Uh, George Ellery Hale uh, moving on to found Mount Wilson and Hell Telescope at Mount Palomar. More recently with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, now with the South Pole Telescope, and telescopes like the Magellan Telescopes in Chile. Astronomers here at the university or with the connection at the university build these facilities and are using them to make transformational discoveries about our universe. Today's uh, session on uh, telescopes and instruments will be broken up into a series of quick talks uh, led by our esteemed panel members here. I'll start with discussing uh, telescopes and instruments in the context of exoplanets, and then we'll move on to CMB, dark sector science, uh, dark, observing dark matter, and then future instruments from the megahertz to the tetrahertz. So I'll kick things off with a discussion of telescopes and instruments in the context of the field of exoplanets. This afternoon, we have a session dedicated to future science and exoplanets. And so I'm going to talk more about the hardware uh, for this field. But of course, I have to set the stage by talking about the science. And it was very interesting as we started to organize for this panel that uh, I think it was Brad that was like, you know, I'm really having a hard time focusing on the instruments. I want to talk more about the science. And I thought that was really good because, I mean, Brad is building instruments, but it's driven by the questions of the science. And so to set the stage for the field of exoplanets, ask this question, what question or questions for exoplanets over the next 27 years? And on one hand, this is a very difficult question to answer because 27 years is longer than the field has really been in existence. Uh, if we uh, date the field about 20 years to 1995, the discovery of the first widely recognized planet orbiting a sun-like star, we realize that projecting forward in time 27 years based on a history of only 20 years is impossible. The field of exoplanets has exploded in so many different directions, especially over the last five years, uh, that it's impossible to predict where we're going to be in 27 years. But on the other hand, this is an easy question to answer, because there's one deep fundamental question that we can address in the field. And I think that makes the field somewhat unique, and that's the question of, are there other planets like the Earth out there? That is, terrestrial planets, temperate planets, planets that harbor life. So this is the deep driving question that the field of exoplanets is constantly being driven forward with. And so this is the question, the question of life on other planets is the central question that the field of exoplanets and leading instruments and te telescopes should be attempting to address. The contrast here is not great, but I want to talk about the measurements that we have to do to assess whether we can see life, if we see the existence of life on another planet. The classical technique for studying the atmosphere of a planet is the direct imaging approach. And so the analogy here is Carl Sagan's pale blue dot, the image taken from the Voyager spacecraft, looking back towards the Earth and resolving the Earth as less than a pixel, but a bluish tinted pixel. More recently, uh, there's been an upstart technique, the transit technique, resolving planets not spatially, but temporally. So this is sort of the small black shadow technique. And so these techniques, in some sense, have been competing over the last few years to make ever more penetrating measurements of planetary atmospheres. But moving forward, these are going to be parallel paths that we're going to use to pursue the question of life on other worlds by studying the atmospheres of Earth-like planets that are being revealed today. So I just want to talk about the roadmap for these two different techniques and the telescopes and instruments that we're going to need to address these questions, this, this central question. So the transit technique has a very well-defined roadmap that should be able to make really remarkable progress over the next 10 years. This is based on transit discovery with new survey missions like the TESS mission that NASA will launch in just a few years, follow-up ground-based observations with instruments like the Maroon X radio velocity spectrograph that my group here is building, uh, observing uh, test planet candidates, confirming those as planets and measuring the masses so that we know which planets are terrestrial planets, 
And then finally, using the James Webb Space Telescope, which is planned to launch in 2018, to search for biosignature gases in the atmospheres of those planets. And this will be a stretch goal for JWST. Probably one or two planets that will invest a few hundred hours for a couple of planets to search for biosignature gases and to try to determine the composition of the atmosphere, the surface conditions on the planet, and determine whether these are truly Earth-like planets. But at least this is a well-defined, we have a well-defined roadmap for this. So this is very exciting that today we see a clear path towards this goal using the transit technique. <coughs> in some sense, the search for life on other worlds using the direct imaging technique is a much more straightforward thing. We need a very large telescope in space with next generation optics that can uh, uh, suppress the central blinding light from planet host stars and resolve planets directly and take spectra from those planets. And so I've just given you an example of one kind of telescope that the field is envisioning. This is the concept for a telescope called the High Definition Space Telescope. This is a uh, 12 meter optical near infrared telescope optimized for direct imaging spectroscopy of Earth. So this is, a, this is a report that was produced by a committee headed by Julianne Del Camp and Sarah Seeger, released just a few months ago. And this is just a concept for the kind of telescope that we hope to build that would have the capabilities to take direct imaging spectra of tens of Earth-like planets orbiting nearby stars. The Giant Magellan Telescope will play a central role in this science, identifying planets to directly image and take spectra of, to search for biosignature gases. And so this is one of the things that I'm most excited about first flight science with the GMT, is using a radial velocity spectrograph with ultra precise capabilities to find true Earth analogs orbiting G-type stars in the solar neighborhood, the ones that we would hopefully be able to image and take spectra of, to search for the signature of life in their atmospheres using a telescope like the HDST. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve, you're next.
But between here and recombination, as I'll mention also after recombination, there is there are there are processes that we can get a handle on with distortion. But you have to get to this minimum state level. And this is a plot uh, by Jens Chula, um, uh, outlining some of those effects. And I'm going to list them, but I like his picture because he tells you what kinds of effects you get at different redshifts. In particular, this era of the recombination itself uh, lends itself to giving you the spectrum <coughs> of lines, hydrogen and helium lines, um, which we have not so far detected. And again, this is because they're starting on paradox. So um, let me just list these things. Uh, so uh, spectral distortions record all the energy input at a redshift of less than 2 times 10 to the 6. And um, there are different kinds of distortions, and that depends on how thermalized the energy that has been put into the plasma, into the photons is. Um, and they, they're characterized by a Y and mu. I won't go into that. But there is a range of redshifts, in particular between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5, where you get a combination that you can disentangle. You can disentangle to some degree when exactly the energy input was. And that's interesting for a number of things because there's <laughs> energy that we know has been input, uh, structure formation. Uh, there's energy uh, that uh, we think might have happened if there was a dark matter of annihilation or anything like that. <coughs> Those are energy inputs that we can not only measure but determine what redshift they have and how much there is. Um, so these are the uh, these are the signatures for these high redshift things. At later redshifts, these are more complicated, but galaxy clusters uh, have an effect on the spectrum and anisotropy and measurements of these these distortion fields. Um, let me not go into the detail. Let me now go into the future. So if you can get to sensitivities of 10 to the minus 9 to 10 to the minus 10. Uh, you'll be able to measure uh, the, the physics and chemistry even of recombination. You'll be able to take a look at the dark ages because there's hydrogen, clumped hydrogen, and there's resonance scattering of the neutral hydrogen, which could in principle be detectable if you get to these kinds of levels. And um, the realization and post realization we will have a measure because again, there are resonance scattering of chemistry in the IGM and of course the NSF in the actual light. Uh, I just have a plot of an example of different, his, different thermal histories, uh, different amounts of population tree stars reionizing the universe and the, the you know, possible uh, 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 intergalactic medium elements that you can see through, uh, through uh, their effect, on, small effect on their on the spectrum. signals. They can't not be there. And it's a matter of sensitivity, which makes it somewhat different from other uh, questions that we're going to be dealing with. So, I just go. All right, here's the better. And then closer. So, I'm sort of talking sort of generally about dark sector science. And, you know, echoing a lot of what Craig said, uh, especially emphasizing the cosmology section. I think one of the exciting instrumental developments in the next 25 years will really be the advent of gravity wave astrophysics. Uh, you know, advanced LIGO is taking data now. We hope to detect the first gravity wave sources in the next you know, couple years, maybe detect it already. Uh, this leads to Pathfinder, which is to try to demonstrate that technique in space, is going to launch in two weeks uh, by the ESA. And in 2034, uh, ELISA is scheduled to launch. Uh, which will really take this concept to an extreme where there's sort of these laser interferometers separated by a thousand, or a thousand kilometers in space. A million. A million. Yeah, that's what I'm A million, yes. <laughs> a million kilometers uh, in space uh, that will really discover, you know, potentially hundreds, if not thousands, of gravity wave sources. And, you know, the exciting part about this really is that this is really a new frontier. You know, no one's ever detected a gravitational wave source. So there's a potential for a huge amount of discovery of uh, physics that we don't even can agree on right now, but in particular, we're really going to learn a lot about general relativity and strong gravity in these sort of regimes, these uh, largest gravity wave sources that we expect some sort of infalling black hole merger type sources. 
And as Craig also alluded to in his talk, that you know, one of the really exciting applications for cosmology is that this really gives a potential for a precision Hubble constant measurement on the order of sort of 0.1%. Uh, if you can really apply this technique as a dis measuring this distance ladder, which will certainly, I think, still be interesting on this sort of 25 year time scale. Uh, and similarly, there's this, you know, there's also some of the comments, there's this real exciting synergy with trying to detect gravity waves with the Fremdo technique and then linking that to gravity waves detected by these CMB experiments and VMOs to really measure the shape of this primordial gravity wave spectrum uh, from gravity wave generated during inflation. Um, and, you know, I think in 25 years, you know, VDVO, VDVO is not going to be built, but, you know, certainly there's going to be a lot of potential there regardless, uh, just stimulate by EVs and uh, whatever these CMB experiments find. So, you know, I think there's a huge amount of potential gravity waves. Um, you know, in addition, one of my science uh, topics here is cracks in cosmology at high redshifts. You know, right now a lot of these current generation dark energy probes are really trying to probe redshift less than one universe to look for the fact of dark energy on evolution, structure formation universe. You know, I think no matter what they find, there's really going to be interest and excitement to try to push those same types of measurements to higher redshift to look for cracks in this cosmological model. Either it's either lambda CDM and we still want to find out where it breaks, or it's not lambda CDM and we really want to characterize this evolution over a longer time frame in the universe's history. Um, and a lot of these searches are really being uh, motivated by, or really being enabled by advances in detector technology. And just as one example, this is a a detector array made for the South Pole Telescope STGG, where these are all superconducting antennas made of argon, but you know, in principle, we hope someday here in this building, uh, in the basements, in the fabrication facilities here, uh, uh, basically millimeter wavelength antennas, which couple light to superconducting detectors, which measure that power. Um, and especially in the sub millimeter, millimeter, and then Eric's gonna talk about this as well, you know, these sorts of devices are really enabling, opening up this new wavelength regime, sub millimeter, millimeter wavelength probing this high redshift universe. Um, and in addition, you know, future 21 centimeter experiments are certainly going to be a start coming online soon and hopefully have a detection and potentially a very powerful probe also detecting this high redshift universe. Optical measurements, all these big glass telescopes, GWST, WFIRST, GMT. Um, you know, and, and as you go to high redshift, you can really start looking for these cracks which are either Evolving or an early dark energy models, we expect dark energy not to be important in a redshift greater than one or so, or much two for this evolution, but maybe it, it could evolve or change in some way. Uh, the flatness of the universe starts becoming interesting as we start to more and more at the sort of sub 0.1% uh, level to sort of test theories of inflation. Uh, neutrinos become important in high redshift in terms of structural information. The shape of the primordial power spectrum tells us, gives us information about inflation. So these are all things that these high redshift measurements are going to enable and are really going to be driven by advances in a lot of this detector technology. And you know, what comes along with this really strong synergy with Eric's that we talked about as well, these submillimeter observations and ALMA, which is a new uh, millimeter wavelength interferometer, submillimeter wavelength interferometer in Chile, to really start individually measuring some of these galaxies that are found in these surveys and start characterizing the history of cell formation, star formation, galaxy formation in the universe through the dark ages of the universe being analyzed. Um, and you know, another interesting thing uh, that I'll highlight is sort of related to these superconducting detectors that you know, Eric is making that we're making for these CMB experiments. Uh, we're, we're developing these new sort of superconducting LC resonators and these quantum limited amplifiers, which also have a pretty broad application. One really powerful example of related to physics, astrophysics, is sort of new creation of these new generation of dark matter, dark photon sort of experiments, uh, which are basically looking for really light uh, dark matter candidates, sort of much slower than EV sort of energy scale. Um, and you know, one such experiment that brings out involved in this ADMX, there are other proposals, uh, there's a experiment called DM radio, which will push sort of sub micro EV. Uh, and really, which, you know, people, well, uh, and really, a lot of these same technology that we're using for CMB and some millimeter wavelength detectors can really be applied to these dark matter, dark proton searches. And you know, we're really now just, you know, uh, as it, assuming we do not find a wind like dark matter candidate, in particular, these experiments become really interesting and more important uh, just to really rule out a whole new class of different types of dark matter candidates where there's huge potential discovery for space. 
enabled by all these superconducting detectors. Super Fermi, 
so the Fermi Large Area Telescope has given us unprecedented sensitivity in sort of the GEV uh, to TEV range in gamma ray astrophysics, but it's really limited in size. Uh, and a lot of that is because you just can't launch anything bigger than Fermi. But with you know, SpaceX and, and you know, the future is in, in space flight, will it be possible to launch something even bigger? There have also been ideas, so it's thrown around doing radio astronomy on the back side of the moon. You could conceivably also build uh, a, uh, a Fermi-like instrument using the lunar, the lunar radolith as your passive material, basically interlace it with silicon uh, or scintillating fibers uh, tracker. Uh, another thing that's being thrown around now for the next uh, decadal review is some kind of uh, MEV energy gamma ray instrument. Uh, and so here you have to combine uh, pair production mechanisms with Compton uh, mechanisms to be able to really measure uh, this large gap in the, the electromagnetic spectrum in the sort of uh, MEV. Um, I think that another thing that's going to be really major here is going to be computing. And so I guess this is a telescope and instrumentation session. Uh, so the current plan with LSST is that the LSST data set is going to be so big that you're not going to be able to download it and work on it locally. So you're actually going to have to submit your uh, processing jobs to centralized computing networks, which would then do the processing for you. And so, you know, a lot of this state-of-the-art um, astrophysics is really going to depend on the uh, uh, increased computing power. And there are questions about whether Moore's Law will continue or not. I think that's, that in order for it to continue, there's definitely going to have to be a pivot. It's going to have to be some kind of shift. Uh, but there have been shifts like this in the past, and, and it's, it's been pretty reliable. Um, so in the end, this is, this is sort of a look at, um, again, wow, that came out terribly. Um, so that's a good thing I overplotted these cartoon lines on, on this plot. So um, the idea is that the dashed line is sort of a, a prediction for what you would expect from dark matter annihilation at roughly the rate that would produce a thermal relic. And I think Dan Hooper will talk about this more uh, later on. Uh, there have been indications of excess gamma rays slightly under this line, uh, and those uh, originate from the galactic center. Uh, so really we're in the state where we need to test uh, whether this is consistent with sort of the dark matter annihilation hypothesis. The reason we need to test this is that the galactic center is an extremely complicated area. Uh, so there are other regions that you can look um, where there aren't, that isn't this complicated astrophysics. And there we're really statistics limited. And so you're really going to gain from having uh, bigger telescopes, more sensitive telescopes, uh, and also telescopes that help you determine the precise dark matter content in these regions uh, better. And so today we have something that is uh, roughly, you know, we're at roughly the same sensitivity between the galactic center and these other probes. Uh, by 2025, with CTA uh, and the LSST uh, more targets, better understanding of the galactic dark matter distribution, we may get down below the sensitivity limit where we would either detect or constrain a dark matter interpretation in the galactic center. By 2042, our sensitivity could run uh, below the thermal relic cross-section, and the limits of this plot are essentially 1 GeV to 10 TeV. And so if you get down to this level and you haven't seen anything, then as Brad was mentioning, the axion scenarios become much more interesting. You start questioning whether you really can have thermal relic uh, dark matter. So, that's, that's
instruments 27 years from now, it's kind of a strange amount of time. So if you ask me five years from now, I could show you SolidWorks renderings of what I think we're going to be building. Uh, if you're asking me 100 years from now, I can show you Arecibo on the dark side of the moon and challenge you all to tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> 27 years is kind of an odd time because we know something, but perhaps not that much. So and what you option? Have to pay. <laughs> You'll be a rat. <laughs> Indeed, yeah, that's the scary part. Um, so uh, one thing we could do is look back 27 years in the past, uh, so what was happening? Well, one year off from that was the Kobe launch, uh, which is kind of interesting. I love this poster that uh, one of the grad students here must have gone back in a time machine and planted it for me. Um, the other thing that was happening, uh, the Caltech CSO uh, had just had its first light uh, the previous year. So. Uh, a couple of other things, uh, 1990, a little short wavelength instrument uh, called the Hubble Space Telescope uh, went up. Uh, also, the Center for Astrophysics, uh, Astrophysical Research in Antarctica was founded in, I believe, 91. Uh, Al Harker was using 32 pixel bolometers on, a, on an airplane to take data at, at uh, submillimeter frequencies. And uh, thinking about some of these things, what I'm struck by is that if you put these people in a time machine and you drop them off now, a lot of the questions we're asking would surprise them, but I think the technology itself probably wouldn't. The feed horns still look like feed horns. We just have an awful lot more of them. Uh, so one option is to take a uh, sort of uh, completely uh, empirical approach and just say, what can we say, not about the questions we can ask, but about the technology that we'll be using to answer them. Uh, so this is the famous Richard's Law plot, uh, based on Moore's Law, of course. Um, in this case, for the number of detectors at millimeter and submillimeter wavelengths. Uh, I've left off uh, a couple of instruments, including those belonging to people here, including BICEP and Hot Plus. I apologize for that. Uh, and you can debate about exactly where the line should be drawn. This line was obviously just drawn by hand by somebody. Uh, but it's fairly clear that things are, in fact, increasing in terms of uh, total number of detector counts. And you can convince yourself it's something like a, like a power law. So one thing we can do is just yeah. Can you make the Sure. Sorry about that. Is that a little better? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so one thing we can do is we can just naively extrapolate this and continue drawing the line out to 2042. Uh, and you come to the conclusion that we're going to have uh, uh, something like a few times 10 to the 9 pixel instruments operating in the <laughs> wavelengths. Uh, that turns out to be something like seven FIFA regulation soccer fields uh, if you were to use that to populate focal planes for a CMB instrument. Uh, that seems like a bit of a cryogenic challenge. Uh, <laughs> probably we're going to be doing other things and facing uh, uh, other problems rather than just beating down on white noise by the time we get there. Uh, but you can also ask the question, what if instead it's actually an integral field unit with uh, multi-channel spectrometers? And then you come to the conclusion that we're actually talking about focal planes that are only a couple of meters in size. And that seems like a technology that I can imagine people here building and operating, uh, well, in the near future, and certainly in, uh, in 27 years. So while I was thinking about this, I did a little bit of Google searching to see what other people predicted for 2042. Uh, as you might expect, 2042 is very specific, so there weren't a whole lot of hits. <laughs> <laughs> Astronomers don't like to make predictions on paper very often. Uh, but I did find a nearby prediction. Uh, which is uh, Ray Kurzweil, <laughs> has been going around uh, claiming that in 2045, uh, computation will overtake humankind in terms of its intelligence, and that the singularity will take off. Uh, so you can take a couple of lessons from this. Uh, I think the naive interpretation is that 2042 is our last chance to build telescopes, and after that, <laughs> uh, looking at the flyby through the uh, GMT yesterday, I, I showed up there kindly on us and decided to fix nicely. <laughs> but the other, the other uh, conclusion you could draw is that naively drawing a power law out into the future and drawing conclusions from it may be uh, an incorrect way to make predictions about the future. Okay, so now a couple of concrete things. Uh, I'm only going to touch on one or two topics and then we'll turn things over to audience questions and discussions. Uh, what are the new, new questions that I think we actually have some chance at answering in the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Uh, one thing that I think everyone probably agrees is going to be big is uh, high redshift 21 centimeter experiments. Uh, so here we're looking at the uh, uh, spin flip transition of uh, hydrogen at high redshift, so at cosmological distances. 
Uh, and you can do a couple of different kinds of science with this. Uh, first of all, you can just look at the hydrogen that's in galaxies at moderate redshifts, redshifts of 1, 2, and 3. And you can do essentially the same sort of large-scale structure studies that you can do in the optical. And there are a couple of experiments such as Chime, which is now actually quite mature and should be taking data uh, any time now at this moment, uh, that will be going after that signal and potentially giving you, uh, giving you a large-scale structure for a sort of different bias than, than optical galaxies, which might be interesting. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can use it to look at reionization. You can both look at the total global amount of neutral hydrogen during that period and trace out the kind of the average ionization of the universe, which is interesting. Uh, you can also look at uh, the uh, look at the inhomogeneity of that structure, and you can look at the size of the growing bubbles of ionized material uh, as the first galaxies and quasars form. Uh, so my prediction is that based on where instruments are now, uh, we're actually going to have essentially all of that science solved by 2042. We'll have uh, very high resolution sort of sub minute scale maps coming from SKA and other, other uh, large telescopes that will actually give us uh, a detailed picture all the way out to the beginning of reionization. Uh, then we'll be talking about combining that with other, other tracers and looking for other, uh, other science we can do with it. Uh, then the big question is where do you go from there? And one option is you go even further back to lower frequencies, much higher redshifts, and you try to say something about recombination and about sort of the, the uh, thermodynamics and chemistry that happened in the very early, well, the, the, the earliest uh, time that we can observe. Uh, that, I think, is going to be a lot more challenging for, for obvious reasons. So I'm guessing by 2042, uh, this slide will say, we've already done everything up to redshift to 20, and now we're talking about what the next big instrument is going to be that's going to go further. Uh, the other thing you can do, of course, is look for uh, other lines. And uh, obviously, this is, this is something of a, a, a pet uh, science topic of mine, but I think it is actually going to be quite exciting and, and become much bigger soon. Uh, in this case, uh, instead of just looking at individual galaxies and trying to figure out the chemistry of an individual object, uh, instead what you can do is actually make a map of the bright spectral lines that you see uh, in uh, not only the galaxies you can resolve, uh, but also coming from all of the structure that you can't resolve individually. And so you can get sort of an integrated picture of star formation, of uh, galaxy content, uh, going back uh, actually quite, quite early, all the way through, uh, through reionization to the earliest, uh, earliest galaxies. And so there's going to be a number of tools for that. One, of course, is ALMA. Now, ALMA's not going to make giant maps, uh, but it's certainly going to follow up many, many thousands of individual objects and give us uh, lots of interesting and rich data sets to play with. And I'm guessing by 2042, there will be a uh, certain number of blank field kind of blind observation maps that Alma will be making, uh, assuming all the time is going to be less valuable than 2041 than it is today, probably. Uh, and we may actually start to get some really, you know, kind of blind statistical survey data out of that. Uh, but it's never going to give us hundreds of thousands of galaxies uh, uh, in, in a blind survey. Uh, if you want to do that, you need something like a large ground-based telescope. I'm guessing in the next 10 years, someone, hopefully us, uh, will build such a telescope and use it to feed all uh, uh, potential candidates to follow up. Uh, now, that gives you all of the light that you can see through the windows in the atmosphere. Uh, that's C plus at redshift 4 to 8. Uh, that's CO at redshift 1 to 3 and a half or so. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of lines and a whole bunch of uh, redshifts at which there are no lines that are easily accessible from the ground. And for that, you really need something like a cold space telescope to get spectroscopy. Uh, so one candidate for that is SPICO, which is a Japanese-European project. Uh, last I heard, they were planning on a 2025 launch, but hadn't actually been approved yet. Uh, so we'll see what, what happens there. But hopefully by 2042, we get for something very like it. Uh, for my own personal reasons, I'd love it if it went to slightly lower frequencies and had more, uh, uh, more spectrometers. But something like it will allow us to really sweep up all of those lines all the way out to redshift 6, 7, 8, and really get a map of everything we care about. So that's all I have. Um, so we thought what we would do, <clears throat> first of all, is invite not only questions, but also statements, since we've only addressed a tiny fraction of all of the world and instrumentation and uh, have left out huge topics. So if anyone wants to make a prediction about anything, whether it's on here or something you've just thought of, or if you'd like to, to ask us uh, any of the panelists and questions? 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 
So I can pick up with a question. Steve, uh, Pixie, let's say Pixie doesn't have it. What's the next C and D steps of assertion thing? What's, what's the next, uh, next instrument that we build? There are plans in Europe and other places. All of them are uh, FTSs, which I think are going to be limited in their sensitivity. So instruments like you're talking about, uh, multi-spectral uh, instruments are going to be the answer ultimately for these, these, these higher sensitivities. So uh, FTS kind of technology by either Europeans or US. Yeah. Sorry? Fourier transform spectrometer, which is how these spectra are measured now. Those are going to get us to 10 to the minus 8. But anything beyond that is the kind of technology you're talking about. It's going to be the technology that's More audience questions. Yeah, Steve, you mentioned that you're going to be able to Anything that's limited just by you know, quant you know quantum mechanics or any sort of other uh, photon noise or anything like that, they're usually oftentimes some sort of super cooking device uh, uh, like a squid or uh, some sort of parametric amplifier. Um, but you know anything that's sort of quantum, you know, by this quantum limit, you can't make the amplifier any better, you can't make the detector any better. It's limited by quantum mechanics. So sort of a general. With that. So all the time, sort of single photon type uh, instruments, they have uh, decent amount of bandwidth. For these axon searches, what you really, you know, you're trying to look at this really low background of particles that don't interact very significantly with the detector, and so you're trying to actually look for a very low signal amongst uh, the principal noise from thermal backgrounds of other sources like that. How's that different than Um, well, I think, uh, uh, you know, in principle, so some of these things, like a squid, is, is, you know, even at some, well, at, I think once you get down to 100 millicolon, it is quantum limited under some regimes for different frequencies. Um, but in addition, I think part of the problem is uh, making an amplifier like that quantum limit over a broad enough bandwidth to be interesting for some of these searches. So I think, you know, I think the immediate, for especially the dark matter, dark photon search I was talking about, I think the immediate thing is you can make a squid that effectively is quantum limited on, under, uh, is if you cool it down to low enough temperature. More questions and comments? So I have a question I could ask uh, each of you. Just in one sentence, can you say the number one instrument that you'd like to see built by 2042? Start with Steve. Yeah, you know, Steve's Steve. obvious one, too. <laughs> uh, it's going to be Lisa. Yeah. Lisa? Yes, absolutely. That, yeah. I mean, the science, that's where the science is. I mean, many, there are many, many interesting things, but if you're asking me for one, that's it. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Eric? That's interesting. Uh, I had a different answer until a moment ago. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think I agree. Yes, tell us the different answer. It's going to get harder as we go. You can't, uh, you can't well, so, I mean, obviously, a, 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 a CMD satellite that would get us down to really compelling GMO limits would be fantastic and is not technically unfeasible. I, I'm not sure it's politically feasible, but, uh, but that, would be, that would be my choice, I think. Second choice. Yeah, I mean, so I, I would say Lisa as well. But, but I would say that. You're violating the rules of the question. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm really excited about some sort of 30 meter, sub millimeter class telescope to really, you know, that Eric was talking about, which, you know, used to be proposed in the form of CCAT, where it's just sort of such a strong complement to ALMA, where it's providing this big telescope with these big surveys, you know, using a lot of the same technology that we're developing for CMB instrumentation that's really up in this new uh, redshift regime of probing dust obscured star formation at redshift sort of greater than two up to the dark ages principle. And then paired with Alma, it's just such a strong complement that you know, it'd be a real shame if something like that wasn't built by 2022. Alex? Uh, yeah, Lisa is strong. I would, I would say that, yeah, I would say that uh, so SKA would be very exciting. 
uh, sort of SKA in its original form. Um, it's been kind of down, down scale. You, you well, so it's been, uh, so SKA, a uh, square kilometer array, um, has, uh, it, it was originally thought that it would be chosen at one site. Uh, it's been split into two sites now. Um, it, it has some extreme challenges in sort of the data rate and the processing. Um, so I think, you know, I think on the 2042 time scale, if we were to build it then, it could be very interesting stage five dark energy uh, instrument. Um, you know, I, I think that would be very cool. What about you? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going to get to dodge this as the moderator. No, so you lose. So my answer, uh, my answer would be the GMT. I'm very excited about the giant intelligence. <laughs> Give him the 10 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going to get a better lunch than the rest of the <laughs> I talked about the GMT as a Planet Finder for a TPF or a HDST type space telescope. And I just intentionally ignored all the other wonderful things that GMT will do in exoplanet science and also many other, other areas of astronomy. In exoplanet science, I look forward to having a GMT fully realized with all the primary mirror segments, with a uh, next generation adaptive optics system, secondary uh, adaptive optics mirrors, laser tomography, and all that stuff to directly image planets, probably not Earth analogs, but to explore all the, the, the fascinating astro and planetary physics that comes with the diversity of planetary systems that have been found. So um, what podcast It's difficult to predict, you know, 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8. I mean, we need to do 10 to the minus 10 to do true Earth analogs. Uh, so that probably won't be possible, but it may be possible to image Earth-like planets around M dwarfs. So that's a particular strength of large ground-based telescopes is the angular resolution compared to anything that you could put up into space. Uh, studying the atmospheres of transiting planets with high-resolution techniques of the optical and the near-infrared, uh, it may be possible, for example, to probe the oxygen lines that are in the Earth's atmosphere and other planets at high resolution, taking advantage of the Doppler shift of those lines, the planet orbits the stars, and we can distinguish those lines from the lines in our own Earth's atmosphere. Uh, so just a wide range of exoplanetary science and astrophysics uh, that the GMT will be able to do. More questions and comments about the future of telescopes and instruments in the next 27 years. Since I have a mic, I can offer a question, which would be, um, how, will we need to change how we think about uh, building and designing space-based missions? based off of the way that, that uh, ind industrial space flight may evolve over the next 27 years. In other words, you have an answer to that. Yeah. Greg, you can call on that. Yeah, so, um, so is one of our collaborators. Um, one of our collaborators are collaborating with um, Sam Walton. SpaceX. <laughs> We offered him a faculty position here at the for SpaceX. He visited us a few months ago, and we were talking about this type of thing. And I was lying about it. He said, mm -hmm. and, 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 um, and he said two really interesting things. One, one of them, and he lets slip, um, as, a, as a future fantasy, one day we're going to have a project for Lisa. Yes. That's, what, that's what you need to make it happen. The other thing he said was, the thing that will make Lisa possible is uh, what Elon's doing now. Um, they are building um, an internet in space. They're putting in 3,000 low recording satellites which are connected by laser connections, data connections, and 10% of the total internet bandwidth in low orbit so that anywhere on the planet you can do better than Comcast gets with Hyde Park. <laughs> unfortunately, we won't work at Hyde Park because there's too many of us in Hyde Park, but everywhere else on the planet besides Hyde Park. Um, anyway, that will make it a consumer technology. So, so all of that stuff is supposedly so hard to do. Seven in front of me is crazy. Let's make it affordable. So I think it will change. It'll be, they're, getting, they're breaking the cost curve on launchers now. And I think it'll, it'll come, it'll break the cost curve for space communication and telemetry and eventually things like Lisa, the, 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 the low zero force technology that you need. Yeah. Can I put my own baby in the list? 
Yes, please. So, the um, audience is also welcome to add yeah, there. So I want to add to the, the, the wish list that we actually do part of the physics from SWIFT by looking at ultra high energy cosmic rays and neutrinos interacting in the atmosphere that we need very sensitive ultraviolet uh, or radio if that works better in the moon uh, to be able to really continue understanding how particles interact uh, way, way past the LHC by using astrophysically produced particles. Since we're talking about 27 years in the future, this is where we should involve the graduate students more. <laughs> Would a graduate student like to step forward and proclaim their number one desired Put instrument for 2042? Is there a yes? Do I hear a yes? Oh, excellent. <laughs> and drink the microphone. very close. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, not long ago, I heard some like, research that people use cell phones. Uh, as a uh, detector, uh, so it would be interesting to have a uh, whole globe of people using cell phones just to detect the time. I don't know what it is. But <laughs> <laughs> Orbiting swarm of iPhones. Can I? Uploading okay, everything to Instagram. This actually already exists for cosmic rays, and you can download an app that if you if you Google, you know, detecting ultra energy cosmic rays with your cell phone, there's an app that you put on your phone which will help with this you know, whole area. And I, we just saw this uh, discussed in China, but I think it's, it's a big one in the US. Andre? Um, so I think one of the instruments of the future will be computer. Uh, because a lot of data will actually be sitting on disks somewhere, uh, and a huge amount, and a lot of it will be unexplored. And one thing that graduate students uh, can do in the future, will, they'll have access, actually unlimited access, to a lot of data, and so uh, having good ideas and coming up with the good ideas and figuring out what cool things you can do with that data that's sitting around somewhere, and being able to figure out how to analyze it, much more of data, I think it will be uh, something that will be quite different from what, where we have now. So I think Andre is advertising his computational answer to this course. Oh, no, it's an instrument. <laughs> <laughs> it's an instrument. John, I'm looking at you. We're going to turn to our local oracle. <laughs> John, I'm going to put you on the spot. Yeah. You What's the number one thing? thing? But I, you know, I was, I was pushing for Lisa before Steve said, so. Uh, <laughs> it's on. It's it close. Yeah. But after that, no, I, so not being, Lisa's not paying attention, but getting away from way up, I, I'm pretty excited about the global thing in Chicago, I'm pretty excited about what Eric's working on. If we can get these spectrometers on a chip and get many thousands of those in a focal point in the sub I think that's a window which we can open up here and it's unexplored and we'll be a great confidence with GMT and so on. I think that's a hopeful thing. It's very exciting. What about the prospects of porting these to optical and infrared wavelengths? Yeah, well, <clears throat> so. Uh, you can certainly use a lot of the same technology in the optical. Uh, you can make energy resolving detectors. You get quite a benefit compared to a semiconductor because essentially the nano factor is much higher if the superconducting gap is small. Uh, so you can make an energy resolving focal plane that works in the optical, or the near infrared, even pushing down into the, you know, kind of much further than you could with the traditional near infrared detectors. Uh, the hard part, of course, is you have to cool it down to 100. Uh, CCDs are really, really good, so you have to you have to come up with a real, uh, real reason why you need to do that. Uh, one thing you get is fast time resolution, which is pretty exciting potential. Uh, I think there's a lot when it comes to transients and things happening on fast time scale that we probably don't even know what's out there to uh, to look for yet. Uh, the other thing you get is high uh, dynamic range, which I'm told by quite a few people are excited about. Um, but again, it's you know the challenge is scaling it up to a huge to a huge enough focal plane to be, to be competitive. Uh, the other thing you can do is lower resolution uh, spectroscopy in order to do something that's a little better than, than uh, photo specs if you want to do a, a, you know, a large scale structure kind of, kind of survey. Um, the thing that I'm really excited about, but uh, as far as I know, not no one's actually shown me a grind of it, but people have been talking about it for a while, is uh, using energy resolving detectors for order sorting on the back end of a high resolution so you, you use a grading to give you a, a very high R of R 10,000 kind of, R 10, kind of uh, optical spectrometer, and then you just put a chunk of energy resolving detector on the back end of that instead of having to do a cross-spectral uh, uh, dispersion. That's, that's 
That's all I know about that. <laughs> Which sounds like a lot. Very good. Yeah, one more question. Or comment. So we'll stop there, if that's okay, because we're right at noon, which is lunchtime. Uh, so it's very clear that the University of Chicago has played an important role over the last 123 years in building and developing new facilities that make cutting edge, cutting edge observations. And clearly, there's a very exciting future over the next 27 years, uh, a broad vision for a various range of astrophysics and technology and things like that. Angela, if you need to say a few words about organization, we reconvene at